Welkom bij de Huddle, de podcast waar we coaches van alle niveaus aan het woord laten om hun ervaring en visie te delen met jullie. Vandaag verwelkomen we coach Ronnie McCollum, head coach van BBC Chrome Lommel die uitkomt in Top Division 1. Coach Ronnie is een man die de NBA van dichtbij volgt. En daarom vroegen we hem welke concepten hij toepast bij zijn ploeg. Mochten jullie nog vragen hebben voor ons of coach McCollum, twijfel dan niet en stel deze dan zeker via onze sociale media. Ready, set and enjoy the huddle. Hi, hi coach Ronnie, how are you doing? Oh, everything is well. Uh, how are you guys doing? Great, I'm doing fine. Thanks, thanks, thanks. Um, yeah, coach, uh, happy to have you here. Uh, thanks for, for, for taking some time eh, the, today to discuss a little bit about the, the coaching aspect within basketball. Um, yeah, it has been the second week when we asked our viewers to send in their questions. And uh, after Sam Rotsart's episode last week, we also received quite uh, some questions for Coach McCollum as well. So uh, uh, we really appreciate the work our viewers did uh, this week again. And here's the first question, Coach. Um, yeah, if we look at, uh, at Coach McCollum, uh, we know that you have the history in uh, American basketball. And... The first question was, which defensive or and or offensive concepts from the NBA could be transferred to European basketball, yeah. according to you? Yeah, well, first of all, uh, I want to thank you guys for having me on. I love talking basketball. I watch you guys' podcasts. I enjoy it. Uh, and, you know, I'm, I'm just a basketball lifer, junkie, pretty much. Uh, you know, so I'm happy to do this. Uh, you know, with, with regard to your first question, the defensive concepts that we can use here in Europe, I think more of the scram uh, philosophy could be used, you know, and that's when the, the ball screen comes and you switch the first screen, instead of the small stand with the big as he dives, you switch off as he's rolling to the basket with a different wing player or a bigger defender to put somebody bigger on the big instead of just accepting the mismatch in the post. Uh, I think that's a big issue. You know, we have problems with that with my team. You know, we everybody wants to switch in certain situations, but I think sometimes we stay too long with the mismatch. And I think that could be easily switched off because the first thing offensive players do when they're looking for a mismatch is they completely stop. They usually put the ball above their head and they wait for the big to get in position. So that gives you plenty of time to switch that back. I think that's something that every team in Europe should start using. And then offensively, I think, you know, just attacking the mismatch. Um, I think, you know, so many, so many coaches are too set oriented, set involved. They want to run a play every single time. And it takes away from the flow of players playing offense because as players, you know, first as coaches, we forget sometimes to think as players do. Mm -hmm. And as players, we want to play. We want to get into the action quicker. We don't want to run a set every time. So with my teams, Uh, you know, we don't, I don't call sets when we get a defensive stop. So we get a steal or defensive rebound, we go, you know, and we, and I give them the freedom to play 50 offense, which is five out or 41, which is one guy in. And now we have certain rules that we get to in our offense, but on missed shots or defensive stops, I don't call plays. I let them flow into what we're doing. Sometimes I'm just as surprised at what happens as anybody else, you know, with certain shots or where the action is, but it's hard to scout that, you know, when you come down and transition and we can go into a pistol action, we can go into a drag screen, we can reverse the ball and go into a thunder action. We can stagger away, we can single away. There's just so many options that we can do. And how do you scout for that? You know, you, you can't scout for that because, and now it's faster, it's free, free flowing. And we get into that two-sided break and transition where the ball moves and we break the free throw line with penetration. So I think that's an easier and more fun way to play than you know me controlling the the action every single possession it's tiring for me and it's frustrating for players you just got to let them play now with that being said you know giving them freedom you got to teach it right and practice you have to teach like these are the actions these are the absolutes when this happens and this domino happens we're into this action right you got to teach spacing well so that's very hard for coaches because it takes a lot of time to teach and you got to give away control And a lot of coaches don't want to give away control when they're coaching. They want to control every possession where every shot comes from. And I don't want to do that because as a player, I hated that. You know, why do I need to go into this spot 
when I have a mismatch. Give me the freedom to post up. Give me the freedom to pop out. Let me run a pick and roll right away into the action. And I think players are better served when we let them have freedom, but we teach them how we want to play. How, how do you implement this in your training, like the, the freedom in 5-0, 5-on-5, 3-on-3? We started off, the, the first thing we do is we teach it, you know, from an individual standpoint. Like, I'm a big person of, you know, five out, you know, offense, 50 or 41, because you have to adjust to the personnel. Now, we have a big on our team. He averages like 18 points a game, and he's a back-to-the-basket five. So we've adjusted to that. You know, if he's rim running, we're going to give it to him right away in transition to make the defense sink. But we start things off usually one on O, two on O, you know, and then we'll play, you know, three on O, and then we'll add, you know, small sided games, the three on two to give the advantage. So the offense can pick it up quicker when they have the advantage. Then we add three on three, and then we build it up five on five. So yeah. usually the first, first, possession I put it in five on zero so they can see it whole part whole I give them the whole play and then we break it down into the one on zero and build it up from there sometimes the the one oh the two oh the three oh is sometimes difficult because of the they don't they use the spacing too much and if they come in the five oh the spacing is not good enough you you see you know yeah I understand And, and what, what we do is we, we give them restrictions. Like if we're doing something one on all out of the handoff, the, the pistol action dribble of handoff. Okay, we put cones out from the slot. You can't pass the slot in this action. Mm -hmm. Now we're giving you cues. Okay, you're being trailed on the handoff, you know, and we give them freedom on that, right? And we don't, we don't dictate every little thing that they do. Say, okay, you're being trailed, figure it out. And then if it goes wrong or that not going the way I want it to go, then I will correct them on it. But sometimes players come up with solutions faster than coaches do because they're the one playing, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm like, and I'll ask them, why did you do that? And they say, yeah, well, he did this. I, I'm like, okay, I like it. And then we add it. So, you know, you give them freedom to play and they, they take ownership of what they're doing. So it becomes better and they'll buy in faster. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you, oh. if, if you're having problems with spacing, You know, you can just put cones out in the slot. You can't pass this. We play from the lane line over. We play from the front of the, uh, the rim over, you know, those kind of things. Or we restrict them with dribbles. You only get two dribbles, you know, those kind of things. Yeah. No, that's that's really interesting, Coach, uh, because here you're, you're talking about a real, a more conceptual offense uh, with a lot of freedom and creativity. And creativity. Um, we've had some coaches before, and when they give a lot of freedom to their players, Yeah, the disadvantage or the risk is turnovers. I think in this kind of approach, uh, offensive approach, I think that you as a coach must have a good yeah, relationship with your players that they know that they should be conscious that turnovers is normal in the beginning, I think. Is that something that you, that you focus on a lot with your players? Or Absolutely. We, we talk about no live ball turnovers. Like if you're going to have a turnover travel, offensive foul or throw it into the bleachers, right? But we don't want you to be indecisive. Like if you commit to shooting the ball, shoot it. You know what I mean? I mean, don't get in the air and then try to decide, you know, read the defense and play, you know, and every team I've ever coached, we always start off the same way with our record. We start off two and five, two and six, two and seven. And then people always ask, why do you do that? Why is it always like that with you? Well, we're teaching them how to play. We want to be our best when the playoffs start. Like, we don't want to start off 8-0 and o, and then we die out in the middle of the season because everybody's caught up to us. Because the second time you play people, you're not going to surprise them anymore, right? So we're teaching them how to play, and it's always tricky every year because, you, you know, your personnel changes. You add new things, new concepts. You know, people get better, so you have to add something to them to, to get them free-flowing into the offense. So it always starts off like that. You're going to have turnovers. You know, guys are zigging when they should have zagged. You know, you're not making shots. You know, they're unsure. But then, you know, you have to tell them, trust it. It's a process. It's a long season. We're not looking for perfection. We're looking for progression. And as long as we're getting better, it will get better. And it always does. You know, and then by, you know, December, no, end of November, December, we start beating teams by 20 and 30 points. You know, in the past couple of years, We lost to a team by 35 at their place in the first game of the season. They came to us. We beat them by 25, right? Same players, 
right? Same coaches, you know, it's just, we, we are better what, than what we were. You know, I want to be better at the end of the season than at the beginning, because every time you look at a season, the team that starts off six, seven, eight, and oh, they never win the championship. Mm-hmm. Why is that? They're not getting better as the season goes on, right? They're staying with the same rules because it worked earlier and you're not making adjustments. We constantly make adjustments. So it's hard to pick up three practices in a week to put all those things in is difficult. You know, when I coached first division, it was hard to do with 10 practices in a week. So it's, it's hard to pick up these concepts because it's new for a lot of players. They're not used to having that freedom. They become frustrated with the freedom. Then they try to overthink They try to make too many plays. And then you got to break it down to them and show them video and teach it. This is what we're trying to do. This is why we're trying to do it. And this is how we're going to do it. And then it gets better as the season goes along. You just told us you, you, you've been the coach of uh, Limerick United. Uh, what is the difference between Limerick United and Lommel, the D1 and the D2, uh, except uh, 10, uh, 10 more practices a week and everything? <laughs> what is another difference? Well, on, on the court is, is virtually the same because basketball doesn't change level to level. The size, the speed and the skill of the players change. That's the only thing that changes from level to level. Um, You know, in first division, you know, guys are trying to go somewhere else. You know what I mean? They're trying to get more money, right? They're trying to get to a bigger league. So you're trying to mesh all these personalities, you know, and six, seven, eight of your players want to be somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And that's hard to get them to buy in and be unselfish and one common goal and talk about sacrifice. They're like, hey, coach, I'm not going to try to sacrifice. My agent told me to get 20 so I can get to Germany. I can get to France. You know, it's, it's difficult. And in second division, you run into more of complacency. Like I'm in second division. This is where, where I want to be. I made it to the top of my level. And it's hard to get those guys motivated. So everybody on your team is not motivated to play. And that's the biggest difference. Now, off the court, the biggest difference is when you're in second division, you run your own program. You pick the players, you pick the time you practice, you pick all this stuff. Now in first division, you have so many people involved because they're on boards and they think just because I give money and I sponsor, I should have a say so on who the players are, Mm -hmm. who should play, how much they play. And, you know, you don't know what you don't know until you coach in that position. You don't know how it really is. You know, when you have board members and, you know, uh, sponsors and fans trying to tell you, you know, you should play this guy, you shouldn't play that guy, or, you know, you can't play that guy that much because he becomes too expensive, right? And things that as a coach, you're not, you're just trying to win games, you know, in second division, they're happy with who, the, who you are, you know, this is the top of the level for most clubs, because they're not thinking about going to first division for financial reasons. And they're just happy that you win and you develop and you're more involved with the youth teams and, you know, with all the coaches bringing those and helping those. So those are the biggest differences between first and second division. Uh, really interesting, this one. Uh... Yeah, yeah, it is. And, and coach, uh, another question that we got from one of the viewers is, uh, are there any specific concepts from the NBA or NCAA that you use at Lommel or favorite concepts? Name it as well, you want. You know, my, my favorite concept is we want we want to get to our best action as soon as possible. You know, and that's that's an American concept. That's my personal philosophy. Like in Europe, and I'm not saying that's a bad thing. And you know, we we have a saying, I'm sure you guys have heard this before too, remove the fluff, right? Mm-hmm. You you got all these dummy actions to get to a mm-hmm. pick and roll. I don't want to do that. I want to get right to the pick and roll. Now, if it doesn't work, we can get back to it again. But I'm not going to run a handoff into a chin action, into a side stagger, into a Chicago action, give the ball to the point guard to run mid pick and roll. I've wasted 12 to 14 seconds, right? And as as far as guarding the mitch, miss, mismatch is that, you know, I want to attack the worst defender or have my best player, you know, in that situation, have the ball as early as possible, you know, and teaching your players to attack the MIG, you know, MIG, most important guy is usually how we approach it from a philosophy standpoint. You know, most people say, all right, we're gonna run the pick and roll and we wanna only involve the two guys that are guarding the pick and roll. Well, we're thinking past that. We're talking about the two guys guarding the pick and roll. We're talking about the MIG, we're talking about the tag. All those things have been discussed because if you notice when you come off a pick and roll, 
and it's a drop coverage or a hard hedge, and you make that first pass out of that action, let's say they blitz it, they put two on the ball, you hit the Draymond roll, the short roll right away, right? Now, what is the first person he's going to attack? He's going to attack the MIG, the bottom defender, you know, and now it becomes four on three. So now if the MIG comes up to help, it's a lob over the top. Or if he holds at the basket, we go into a floater. And, you know, telling players and explaining that this is what we're looking for becomes a lot easier for them. It's a lot of information at first, but it becomes really easy after you practice it for a while. One of the, the concepts in the NBA is also the, the mismatches and the, the one-on-one, the ISO plays. The only thing I think the difference in the ISO plays in the NBA in Europe is in Europe is the ISO plays much quicker than in the NBA. Sometimes they dribble, dribble, dribble. What do you think about that? Well, a lot of times with the with the over dribbling that you get with James Harden and Luka Doncic is they're setting up actions because a lot of times when you watch NBA teams play, if they have three players on one side, they'll shoot that player through to get two and two for help side reasons, right? So they always want the corners filled. And in Europe, they don't have that, you know, built into their system and concepts. It's like, okay, I got the mismatch, now I attack. And you might have two people in the dunk spot, but in Europe, that's okay. In the NBA, they're trying to get to maximize spacing to, to tell, you know, the guy with the ball where the help is coming from. That's why it takes longer. Okay, that's... Uh, that, that... That's a good one because I never thought about that, wh why they do it. It's always like maybe I have to dribble a lot uh, between my legs. Uh, I didn't see it like that. So it's very nice to, to hear uh, about this. Um, how, what, what do you prefer for your team? To wait or the quick one? Well, well for us, we, we use a term, we call it uh, let it come out in the wash, right? So if we get a switch, You know, we're, we're going to attack right away. And if we're going to wait for that big to roll down into the to the dunk spot or into the charge circle, we want to move it quick. Because what happens is on that switch and there's a mismatch five against one, everybody on the weak side starts coming towards the ball. Once we move the ball around the perimeter, now we force long closeouts. Mm -hmm. That's where we want it. That's where he's going to get the ball inside, not standing there with the ball above your head, you know, pass fake and pass fake and waiting him to get there. And just, you know, here in Europe, you know, in Belgium, how many guys do we trust to go, you know, 10 dribble one-on-one? -on -one? We don't have those kind of players. Now, if I had Luca, if I had James, I had Dane Miller, yeah, we would all let him go, you know, 10, 10, 12 dribble ISO, but we just don't have those guys. So, and it's more fun to just get it moving. Now, everybody touches it. Now, everybody feels involved. How, how do you explain that to the young guys? Because... I'm also a, a U21 coach and they always see NBA and on, <laughs> on practice. Yeah. They all uh, Lillards or, or Doncic uh, players. How do you explain that to them? They are not able to do that. Well, I, I usually, I usually ask them a question and I'll say, you know, that shot you just took that five dribble step back. How often did you practice it? And then I wait for their answer. And I say, okay, Dane, Steph, they practice at, you know, four hours every day in the summer. Did you put that much time in? And then I say, when you put that much time in, then I'll let you shoot that shot. But on this team, until you could put those hours in, we're just going to move it and let it come out the wash. That's usually how I answer. And then they usually understand that better than, you know, you just scream it at them, tell them not to shoot that shot. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's true. Oh, great. Yeah, one thing I noticed uh, here in this in this podcast today, uh, that's why I like to have a, an English speaking coach, because we hear another terminology, some some expressions. And because we have a lot of young coaches as well who are watching these episodes. Uh, before, in the beginning, you were talking about dominoes. Uh, get the advice. Can you explain it a little bit what that term means for the young coaches? Okay, the, the term domino came from Greg Popovich. And, you know, the game dominoes where you stack them up and you knock them down and they all fall over. I don't know how to say that in Dutch, but that's what a domino is. And basically, you know, the concept behind dominoes is how fast you can get into an advantage and keep the advantage. And that's what dominoes are. You know, so if uh, we come down, 
and we get a pick and roll and they hard hedge it and we kick it ahead, right? And now we force a long closeout, okay? That's the first domino. Now, where do we go on penetration? Does this guy, you know, get to the dunk spot? Does he, does he circle? Does he butt cut? You know, those are so many terminology they can use. But if we're going to have four on three attacking the basket, we want to keep the advantage, right? The hardest thing for defenses to guard are long closeouts. If we make the defense sink and we kick it out, that's our advantage. And we want to keep that advantage by doing something quick. We're going to shoot it or we're going to attack the closeout with the drive. Now we force another help. Now we kick it again. And now we're just staying in dominoes, those kind of things. Now in Loma, we have a thing, we, we call it SSI. And that's side, side, and in. Now, when we, we start a possession, we, we chart how many SSIs we get per game. Now, a side-sided end is basically when the ball goes from 145 to the other 45, that's a side-to-side. -side. Now, after it comes from 145 to the other 45, we want an in action, which means a penetration. We want the ball to break the free throw line, either with the pass or the dribble. Now, once you get the defense to flatten out on that penetration, your dominoes start. Because now on penetration, when the ball breaks the free throw line, three, four guys that have to help over to stop the ball. And now your dominoes have started. Now we always have four people outside the three-point line. Our rule is only one player can be inside the three-point line without the ball at any time. And that could be any player. So now when the dominoes start to fall, the person who's driving the ball understands I have three guys outside the three-point line for that kickout shot. And that's how we play. So we chart it and then the, the interesting thing is, is that when we chart it and we emphasize it all the time, you can hear guys on the bench during the game, SSI, SSI, you, you know, they're calling it out as it happens. Yeah. So now, you know, we go on an 8-0, 10-0 run and the other team calls a timeout and you got guys coming to the bench like we got three SSIs in a row. So now they're understanding how important it is. We watch video on it and we're counting. We're like, look, look at this. There's a domino. There's another domino. So those things become fun and they buy into it. Mm -hmm. If I understand very well, so on the penetration and they kick the ball, they have to see they are immediately outside the three-pointer. They, they got to get out. Now, we give the freedom uh, on the pitch out. We let them read. Like, okay, we have a left-handed guy that we usually put in the left corner, right? Mm -hmm. Because most teams force baseline, so that's by design. So we know when we kick it to our left-hand player and he's a shooter, he shoots about 40% from three, we know he's going to drive left. So now in that penetration, he's getting away from his left hand because he knows what's coming. You know, so those kind of things. And now you're knowing your players on your team and now it becomes easier to get out of the way. So that's how we do it. Yeah, because sometimes with the young players, they penetrate. They, what we, we learn, learn a lot is the, the young coaches is penetration. They do the jump stop pass and there's no fluence. They, they're, mm -hmm. they're still, they, they don't go out. So this you have to improve also every time with young guys. I think last week Sam told us sometimes we, we learn some things and we don't do it, like the two-hand uh, bounce pass. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's true. And, and it's, it's so funny that you say that because a lot of my philosophy changed when my children start playing basketball, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, like I said earlier, sometimes as coaches, we forget how it is to be a player, right? We have to think like players think. So I'm thinking, what is the fastest way to teach my children something and streamline it and make it game like? So when they were four, five, six years old, we're in the backyard and we did everything with one hand, except for shooting, right? A lot of people do form shooting with one hand. We did form shooting with two hands, you know, like, like everybody teaches it. That's the only thing we did with two hands. We did all layups, one hand, all passes, one hand. And what I found was, is that they became stronger doing things with their left and right hand faster than if I taught it to them two hands and make them right-handed dominant all the time and then try to teach them left. So even now, like our vitamin package, you know, the vitamins is what we do every day, you know, with, with my kids. We go out in the backyard and we do 10, 15 minutes of vitamins, all one hand stuff, all hook passes with the one hand, bounce passes with the one hand, chest passes with one hand, layups with one hand, same foot, you know, we shoot a left-hand layup, it's off our left foot. We do it with our right foot, with our left hand, with one hand. Everything is done with one hand. And I'm seeing them improve. You know, they're a lot more advanced than I was at that age because I didn't make a left-hand layup till I was like 14. 
Mm -hmm. Right. So it, it becomes they become they trust it more. They've done it more. And it becomes a lot easier just to streamline it and do everything with one hand. No, no, that's that's great. Then I like it. I love the fact that you're uh, taking that time as well with your kids. I think that should be normal. Each each parent who is I uh, who wants the, his kids to purchase their their dreams. Yeah, I think that you should put in that extra work because now. As Mike said before, the youth players, they watch NBA games, but they never get to watch the, the extra efforts that those players put in. And that starts from a very young age. So, uh, yeah. Absolutely. And, and I tell my kids all the time, I said, listen, I said, we're not going to be in the backyard for, you know, doing these 90, you know, minute, two hour workouts. I said, listen, I said, if you give me five hours a week, right? I said, give me five hours a week and we're going to do specific training for your skill set. Right. And a lot of skill trainers don't do that. They just do these all encompassing drills. They put everybody through the same drill and it's not really benefit. They get better. Yes. But they're not as good as they could be if you would specialize. So, you know, my daughter and my son live here. I'm their coach all the time and they have completely different skill set. They do things completely different. Right. I teach them the same thing, but it looks different. They feel it different. They, their favorite move is different. So I say five hours a week. And then I said, how many hours is that in a year? And then they did the math and they said 240. And I said, how many days is that? Right? It's 10 mm -hmm. days in a year. I said, you can't give me 10 days out of 365. I said, 10 days. I said, you're going to spend more time playing TikTok and being on PlayStation than that. I said, 10 days. That's all I'm asking for outside of your practice. I said, now, the thing about that is, I said, if we start at nine, when we started with this, they were nine and, and eight at the time. Right. So they're like 18 months apart. So we did that five hours a week. Now I said, now think about this. I said, when you become 16, 17, look how many extra hours you put in over your competition. Just those 10 days. Like, and we hadn't even got into the two hour workouts, the three hour workouts, you know, those kind of things. Not counting when we go to America and we have the gun machine and they're in there and that just five hours of specific training. You're surpassing, you know, your competition because they can never catch up. Even if they go four or five hours a day, you put this in for years, they can't catch up to you. So that's what I try to tell them. Like, listen, you, you're going to waste enough time in your life doing fun stuff. I said, you can give me 10 days a year. And, you know, we'll increase that when they get older. But for now, we're going 10 days a year. That's how, that's how we look at it. And when you explain that to kids, 10 out of 365, oh, that's nothing. Penis. That's how we do it. Now I'm going to be a little bit the bad guy. Okay. okay. Uh, do they do they feel it like I have to do it because of my dad or is there also the they say okay I want to do it dad I want to train I want to go it, it's it's funny because you know it's, it's it's like your coaching philosophy right you you treat everybody fair but you don't treat them the same right and it's the same thing with your chi with your kids right my children have helped my coaching because my daughter is completely different than my son Mm -hmm. personality wise, when they want to work, my daughter, I never have to beg her to work. She's begging me, come on, dad, let's do extra. My son, I have to turn off the PlayStation, <laughs> you know, I have to, you know, I have to put the tablet down, you know, but once he's there, he works. Yeah. And it's not always easy because I'm dad and I'm now I'm trying to be a coach. So you're trying to get them to build habits, you know, and I tell them all the time, I said, listen, you told me you wanted to be good. I didn't ask for this. You said you wanted this. What, what were your goals? And they repeated back. I said, okay, how do you get there? You got to work at it. You know, and it's not always easy. And sometimes they cry. And then my wife is mad at me, you know, th <laughs> those kind of things. But, you know, you know, I've never seen a good basketball player who didn't work hard. I've never seen. It. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it doesn't happen. You're not good unless you work. And that's what I'm trying to tell them. Like, listen, you don't have to be the best 12 year old and 10 year old I've ever seen. Right. We're doing this from when you're 18, 19, 20 and up. Like we don't have to see the progression now. Right. We'll see it later on. Right. That's what I care about. I said you might not see it now, but it's coming. It's coming. Right. So and stressing that to young players is the hard thing because they want to do everything right, right away. And you got to tell them, like, listen, we're building this for five years from now. They, they want to follow your dreams, like in uh, going to the United States, the college and everything yeah they they, they want to go and and i have a cousin at the university of uh, detroit mercy he's been the top five in division one and scoring the past three years and he's a projected first round pick 
not for 2021, but for 2022. Mm -hmm. And we went to Detroit the last time we were in America, and his name is Antoine Davis. And he broke Steph Curry's three-point freshman record. So that shows you how skilled he is. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know what? We're going to go up there, and we're just going to watch Antoine work out. And we, we just literally sat there and watched him for like two and a half hours work out. And I said, now, do you want to be as good as him? And they, of course, they both say, yeah, all right. And I say, do you see how hard he works? Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. Now, now they have that example because it's one thing for daddy to tell them. It's mm -hmm. another thing for them to see it. And when they see it, then they're like, oh, now I understand how hard it is to be good. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. That's uh, some great stuff, coach. Um, yeah, if you come back from the States to Lommel, uh, uh, your current role at Lommel, uh, we, we had another question from one of the viewers who was very curious about how does a practice week look like at Lommel in season or pre uh, or pre season, whatever you want, coach. But uh, some viewer was very curious about it. And I will tell you, it was not my coach at Contig. So. <laughs> Well, well, you know, in the in the preseason, uh, you know, we're, we're trying to, you know, put in our offense and our defense. You know, we break it down from the minute detail, you know, and I've had assistants in the past. And they say, sometimes you just go too fast. So I said, you know what? You're right. You know, because sometimes things get lost in translation. You know, my terminology book, you know, we have like 50 words that we use per season, just basically you know, specific terminology. So you, you have to teach them that. We do everything through email. So we're emailing them, you know, our vitamins and all those kind of things. So the preseason is more breakdown, you know, making sure we get our spacing correctly, make sure we move the ball, you know, those kind of things. Now in season, how a typical week goes is that if we play a home game on Saturday, I come home Saturday night, the kids and my wife go to bed, I watch the game, right? I don't take any notes, I just watch it, right? Because the emotion from the game is still there, right? Because players are over the game five minutes after the game, five minutes to 10 minutes after the game, then we as coaches start worrying about everything we did wrong, especially when you lose. So I just watch the game as, you know, an innocent bystander, basically. I'm just observing objectively, just watching. What can I do better? What could be done better? Those kind of things. Then on Sunday, I watch the game again, and then I'm taking notes and I'm charting our SSIs, How many closeouts did we have with no hand up? How many box outs did we miss? Those kind of things. So then Monday uh, at our practice Monday, uh, we do only skill development and small sided games, two on two, three on three. That's all we do. We don't do anything full court on Mondays. We were, we're trying to get, you know, 200 to 300 shots up in that Monday practice, get their confidence going, those kind of things. Now at the Tuesday practice, we already start doing, well, how a typical practice works is this. I come in on Tuesday, you know, we practice at 7.30. It's a two-hour practice. At 7.28, I roll the TV out. We watch two clips from a previous practice, okay? This is what we have to get better at. We call them AOIs, areas of improvement. This is what we have to do better on. And then I always end it with, this is what I want to see more of. This is great. So it's two clips. It, it takes about a minute. And it's about the practice, clips of the yeah, practice. From the previous practice, yes. So mm -hmm. what I do is, and then I say, okay, let's have a good day. Because sometimes we as coaches, we talk too much at practice, right? We need to get them going, right? And I'm the type of person, if practice is at 7.30, we're starting at 7.30 and we're going. We're not talking. I'm not talking. And we go 15 minutes of vitamins, which is skill development that is specific for your uh, position, you know, where there's, you know, running hooks, floaters, shooting behind the screen, you know, twisting the screen, pull up jumpers. Our, our post players are in the dunk spot, you know, working on those Tiago splitter finishes, reverses on the other side, jump hooks, those kind of things. Then coach, after coach yes. can I ask you something about that? Because it's very interesting. You say uh, 15 minutes of the things you, they are special for you. Do they know that by themselves? Do they have uh, a paper or something or you tell them? No, I, I send, we, we, with our vitamins, we do the same vitamins for two weeks in a row. And I send that to them via fast draw to their phones okay. because this generation does everything on their phone. So paper scouts, you can you can stop wasting paper, save the trees. I send everything to their phone. They all have their vitamins. So when we come together and say, let's have a good one, one, two, three, you know, together, they're off to their baskets. They know what they have to do, right? So we're getting up a ton of reps. Then after those 15 minutes of vitamins, we go into one-on-one. -on -one. We play a ton of one-on-one. -on -one. You know, we play, 
you know, one dribble, you know, two dribble max, uh, first one to three, you know, you might have to play 15 possessions in a row from the left wing. We just mix it up. We play one-on-one, -on -one, then we play two-on-two, -two, and then we either play three-on-three -three or four-on-four. Then -four. we stretch, which is like a minute, because <laughs> I don't believe in stretching because our time is so limited, you know, in second division, we have three practices a week. So we're not going to waste 10, 15 minutes on doing stretch. You get a minute, minute and a half, get some water. You're already warmed up. You're sweating. Let's go. You know, we come back, we do a shooting drill, and then we're writing into our team specific stuff on Tuesday, four on four. We're already putting in the secondary break and the main ball screen action from the team that we're going to play. So we're correcting some of the things that we need from the previous game. We're also working on the other team's main actions, but I don't tell them this, their main action. You know, if a team is running diamond, we'll guard it four on four. Or if they're doing Spain pick and roll, we'll play that four on four. And we'll talk about how we're going to guard it without them knowing. Then we're into five on five stuff. Now it's strictly about us, you know, specific stuff, correcting, you know, and getting better at the things that we need. And then uh, at the end of practice, we do special situations where I'll say, okay, uh, white team is up two with a minute to go with the ball. Both teams have a timeout uh, and let's go. And then, you know, we play it like a game. We play free throws, everything. And, and all our five on five games, you have to win the game with a made free throw. So if Mike, you come down and you're playing against Ghana and you score the winning basket for red, all right? Mike, you go to the free throw line. You make it game over. If you miss it, we keep playing. Now, if you come back again and you win and Mike, you go to the free throw line and you miss the second time, your team automatically loses baseline suicide. That's how we do it. Yeah. So now we're adding game elements to, all right, you got to make a pressure free throw, yeah, you know, those coaching. kind of things. And then for the Thursday practice, you know, we're doing everything game specific. You know, we're doing vitamins. We're getting up a ton of shots. We're trying to get up, you know, 150 to 200 shots. We go over the scouting report live versus the other team, their secondary break, uh, their half court sets. You know, we talk about personnel, those kind of things. And, you know, after the practice, we're watching video. Uh, on the other team. Oh, one thing I forgot on Tuesday, we watch video from the previous game. Uh, video is never more than 15 minutes. The clips are usually, I clip it up and it's usually about eight minutes. And then we're talking and teaching, asking questions, those kind of things. And then on the Thursday practice, we do the same thing. We say, okay, this is Gunnar. This is how we're going to guard him, you know, in their two side, two down. This is what we're going to do. We're going to ice this situation. We're going to weak this situation or we switch that situation. We're very specific in what we're going to do. And then as soon as practice is over, I email them the video. Uh, they'll have the scouting report on their phones as soon as practice is over on Thursday. So they just saw it on video. They've gone through it and now they can read it. That's usually how a typical week goes for us. Good. Okay. A lot of time for you to do to make this. If if they don't follow your plan, what is your reaction then? <laughs> yeah, because uh, I know what time. You, if you tell me you you do the video, you do the papers, it takes from some time. Yeah, and 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 the thing is too, and you know, I tell them all the time. I said, listen, if if I want you to be your best, I've got to be my best, right? So you know, with the scouting reports, we never put anything on the scouting report more than two sentences. Right. Because, you know, like I said earlier, remove the fluff. You know, I, I remember in college, you know, for we played Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, and we had scouting reports that was like 35 pages long. Like, how are you putting all of that in your brain? You know what I mean? Because you, you're going to remember one of two things. Can he shoot it or can he drive it when you're guarding somebody? Right. Right. And then the actions, you remember the plays because we're screaming it out from the bench, you know, watch the flare, you know, those kind of things. But we usually say, We have, a, we have a three three word system for how we guard players. We call it a Simmons, a Mitchell, or a Curry, uh, I, right? I, so Ben Simmons, you cannot shoot at all. We can go under on screens. We're giving you shots. Mm -hmm. We go Donovan Mitchell, which means you can shoot it and drive it. Or we go Curry, which we say NAS. We call it NAS, no airspace. Like you have to be there on the catch. There's no excuse. So the good thing is, is that players, when players hold each other accountable, I don't have to say anything. Right. Because now, you know, if we're we're not in the guy, we're NAS in him and you catch it and shoot it, you know, you're coming out. Right. Because, you know, you messed up. You know what the scouting report says, because it says NAS right next to his name. So, you know that. So when those things, because now you saw it, I told you before the game, I told you on Thursday, there's no excuse for not knowing. it. So I don't even get mad. They know they're coming out right away. 
what what you gonna say with Gunnar? <laughs> you know the the funny thing about Gunnar and and his brother Lars, they play very similar, and you know they they give me a lot of problems because they're so smart and how they do it. Like they don't take bad shots, right? <laughs> you know, it, it's it's hard to game plan for them because you're like, listen, he might not shoot it for ten minutes but he can make shots and get people, you have to stress that over and over during the game. Like, listen, don't relax because he can make plays. You know, I don't want to give too much away because then he's going to be prepared for it, but that's usually what I'm I taking tell notes. I'm taking notes. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you know, your teammate is the most frustrating player that I think I've ever guarded in my life. Uh, uh, Eli uh, hey, Van Aken. Aken, yeah. oh, This guy, He doesn't shoot three well, but he makes threes. He's not a driver, but he can drive. He's an unbelievable cutter, right? And the moment you start ball watching, he butt cuts you and gets a layup. Yeah. It drives me crazy. Yeah, yeah. Like, I would I, tell him, especially as I got older, I was like 37 when I played against. I said, Eli, stop running. Like, stop moving. Just stand and be tired with me. And he just started laughing. But he, he is the... He is a type of player that's harder to game plan for because mm. what do you put on the scouting report, You're, right? You know, some players are like, okay, can't go left, can't go right, can't shoot, right. only shoots, left shoulder, you know, those kind of things. But what do you say for Van Aken? Mm. He moves well. He I played with everything. I played with uh, Ailey uh, for several years in the, in the youth, and he was even when when he's young, he was like this. It, it, it difficult to 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 guard this guy. This. Yeah. Uh, Yeah, and it's very athletic. Very yeah, athletic. exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Well, it's funny that you bring it up because I I, I really love Eli. Yeah, I love his, his his style of playing. And on practice on Thursday when we play a scrimmage five on five, I'm always make sure that I'm against him because <laughs> I just love. To, even when I play defense on Eli, he can confirm. Sometimes like one or two minutes, I don't even look at the ball. I only look at his hair because it goes to there. <laughs> That's, uh, he's, he, yeah, he's always running. And yeah, I think in your concept, in your type of offensive aspect, I think he would match perfectly because he's always thinking one step ahead, making decisions all the time. Yeah, and that's what what frustrates a lot of defensive players. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We were talking about a five on five. Do you play short five on fives or do you play them 10 minutes or? Um... We we had some, uh, we normally play, you know, we play the 10, you know, twos and threes. And then we had some medical screening and the doctor who did the medical screening said, you know what, you need to increase their workload to have them play at five minute intervals. So we changed that based on the medical screening uh, a couple of years ago and then guys We're in better shape the following year, but normally we play, you know, the 10, like, because sometimes when the game goes to 15, it can get a little bit sloppy and I want mm -hmm. them to be sharp. And that way, you know, when I said earlier, like, as we, as coaches, we talk too much when you have short games gives you an opportunity to correct faster instead of stopping people. Because what drives me crazy as a coach is when you watch other coaches coach in practice and every 20 seconds, stop, stop. Well, nobody's getting into a flow. Don't kill their sweat. Like you play games to 10. Now you can teach it. You can teach while the game is going on, right? You know what I mean? Get to the corner, get below the break, you know, hand up on closeouts. You know what I mean? Fight the post. You, those kind of corrections are good, right? And, you know, how are players going to learn if they're not making mistakes in practice, right? Like I don't, I'm the type of coach, I don't want my practice to be perfect. I want it to be sloppy because now we're learning. Right. If we're throwing the ball all over the gym, now we're going to figure out that we don't need to do that when the game starts. We want the game. We want practice to be tougher than the games. Right. So there's consequences for losing. And, you know, this year we're going to implement the winner's chart. And what the winner's chart is, is that every time we play anything with the team aspect or shooting, you know, two on two, one on one shooting drills, three on three, all the way up to five on five. Every time you win, I'm going to keep that. Right. I'm going to record your wins. So at the end of the week, if little Johnny has 25 wins and he has most on the team, we might do a prize for him. Like we're going to give you some incentive, mm -hmm. you know, to, to win in, in drills because you have so many players at all levels. This happens in the first division level. It's like they don't care whether they win the drill or not. Look, like, yeah. how are you building competitiveness if you don't care what oh, it's Tuesday? You know, you know, you got to care about all of them. You can't just care 
when the game starts. It's too yeah. late to care. You got to care the whole week because now you're building habits, you know, that makes you a winner. Is this something you you think about yourself or from another coach? That that I stole uh, from um, the University of Arkansas uh, women's basketball coach Mike Neighbors. He came up with the win chart, and they have you know you know in America in college they have unbelievable facilities. They're the only one that use that gym, so they bring out this huge whiteboard and they put every player's name on, and they're checking like wins and losses. And I'm thinking that's a great idea. We're gonna use that. Yeah, that's that's you have some other ideas. Uh... For, for young coaches, for something to implement them uh, on, on practice? Uh, I think, I think you know, the thing is, is that, you know, as long as you're, you're doing, you know, skill development things that happen in the game. And, you know, the other thing that drives me crazy, you know, when you watch, you know, other teams practice is that they're working on things that never happens in the game. How are you making your players better? Like, I want 90 to 95% of my practice actions that happen in the game mm -hmm. you know and, and a couple of years ago I went to a practice and it wasn't in Lomo before anybody in Lomo thinks I'm talking about them mm -hmm. I was watching a youth practice it was U12 and for 20 minutes they were working on reverse layups U12 and I'm thinking how often have you seen a game U12 where a kid makes a reverse layup or tries a reverse layup you're wasting 20 minutes of your practice time like we're not going to work on anything that's not going to happen in the game or could happen So we're making it very specific for everybody on our team because you're only good at what you practice. We're going to rep things that are going to happen. We're not wasting time. We're not going to, you shoot one layup and then you stand in line for five seconds, you know, 45, 50 seconds. You're only getting 18 reps in 20 minutes. No, 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 no. We're going to go in short groups, small groups, and you're going to maximize it. We're doing 15 minutes of skill development. You're going to get 100 reps in. Like we're going to rep it a lot. So there's no excuse because we just don't have the time in the lower divisions to do all that stuff. And even in first division, when I played first division, we would have, you know, the morning practice was a waste of time. You go in there with a sheet of paper and you shoot 10 shots from the left wing, 10 shots from the left, you know, the corner, and you just chart them down. There's nothing game specific about that. You know, you, you got me in the gym just because you paid me to be here twice a day. That's basically what it was. You know, guys don't tie their shoes. You know, guys still have their hoodie on. But how is that game like? You're just in there just going through the motions. But if you don't waste players' time, they'll practice harder. Because, like I said, we start at 730, and they know we're going. They know that we're not stretching. So I tell them, if you know we're not stretching, come 15 minutes earlier, jump rope, stretch, if that's what you need. But you know once we go, we go. That's it. Very interesting. You... You, you you mentioned it about uh, pro training. Yeah, you've been there uh, with, in Limburg. Um, Sam, last week, he told us maybe he wants to go to one practice with Chalarwa. What do you think about that? I, I don't know you understand very well with his West Flemish accent, but <laughs> that, that's what he said at a certain moment. He wants to go maybe to one practice a day with the professionals. What do you think? I think that's because when I played in Bree First Division, we had an American coach named Don Beck, right? We practiced one time a day. We finished first in the regular season and we made it to the finals. So, you know, when you know, especially, you know, in a pro situation where you have access, you're not limited by gym time. You know, in lower divisions, you know, you got volleyball, handball, indoors. You're really pressed for time. But in First Division, if you have access to a facility, Why do you need to practice two times in a day? NBA doesn't practice two times in a day. Come in, get your work done, don't waste guys' time, and then you can get your skill development and your extra shooting in at the end. Why not? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I when I was a coach in Lindbergh, we, we did something where we split the groups up. So in the morning practice, we would only bring the point guards in on Monday, you know, the two guards on Tuesday, that morning practice. And we did something very specific for them. Mm -hmm. And I felt it was better. You know, and we eliminated the the morning shoot around on day of a game, right? Why are we doing that? I, I don't want you to break your rhythm. I want you to understand you stay in the same rhythm every day, right? And that's what we did. And, you know, the thing I don't understand, and I'm not trying to knock anybody, I just don't understand it, is when I coached in Lindbergh, 
uh, me and my assistant, Thomas Royackers, we were there early at practice and we were in our t-shirt and shorts and we're individually working guys out before a game. So all our guys got to sweat and we would always make jokes about the other coaches. They come to the gym in their suit. Like, how are you getting guys prepared? Like I'm literally sweating, trying to guard, you know, Jonas Della, you're in the post on pick and, and on pick and pops before a game, because that's what you're going to see in the game. You know, and I think a lot of people get confused when they watch NBA games. They watch the warm up, the layup line. You know, they're doing these jelly layups and they're not going hard. Well, you didn't see what they did three hours ago, right? You know, they've been in the gym for four hours, right? So they've already got their work in. So you don't have to really go hard and screaming at guys in, in the layup line if they've already got their work in. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, co coach, talking about being a coach. Uh, in, in, a, in a first division. Uh, one of our viewers has the dream, and I, I suppose you won't be the only one, uh, to become a professional basketball coach, even without having played basketball professionally by himself. Which advice or what advice would you give to that coach in order to make good connection with pro players or to look at the game that pro players look at um, any advice you would give to that uh, specific coach? Yeah, and, you know, and, I, and I'm sure you guys have heard this. You know, we have a saying, you know, coming from America. They don't, they won't care how much you know until they know how much you care, mm -hmm. right? Uh, my other advice is, you know, be you, right? You can't, you can't be the twin or the clone of your head coach. You can't be who the board or anybody say you should be. If you're a calm personality like I am, I'm going to be calm. Like, I'm not a screamer. That's not who I am. And, you know, people realize and recognize authenticity. Like, if you're, that's really who you are, then be that person, you know, and that, and don't come off phony and, you know, those kind of things, you know, don't teach what you know, right? Don't try to go out there and do some drill that you saw, you know, Phil Handy or Chris Johnson or Drew Hanley do. Don't do that. Do what you do, right? Teach what you know, right? And the best thing is, is that once you show that the professional player, you're there to help them, they'll respect that because that's what they want. They want to know, can you help me? And if you can't help me, they won't deal with you and never lie to them, right? If you want them to do something, spend more at the professional level than it is in second division, but also at the second division level. If you tell them something, you better have video evidence to back it up because once you tell them, you better show them because The first thing players do when you, I don't want to say criticize or critique, when you try to correct them and coach them and teach them, they put up a wall, they get defensive. Yeah. But now when they see it for themselves, video doesn't lie, right? Hey, you know, Steve, you didn't run, you don't sprint back every time in transition. The first thing, yes, I do. Okay, well, let's watch this. Do you think that's sprinting back in transition? Now they've gained your respect because now they know that you study. And you're trying to help them, right? And then, you know, they'll respect that more because you're trying to help them improve their game, which means more money or playing in a different league. And then the last thing, you know, if you want to get into someone's inner circle, rebound for them. You know, go up to me, you want to get some extra shots up, I'll rebound for you. That's the quickest way for you to build a bond with somebody because you're helping them get better, right? And me as a player, and I'm thinking me as a player, like the best bond I had with any of the coaches was the guy who rebound for me every day. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, who, that's who I talked to. When I had a problem, I went to that coach. You know, when I'm frustrated about the head coach or something, I went to that coach. That's who you are because as an assistant coach, your bond with the players is more connected than the head coach. Because as a head coach, we're like, we're looking at the totality of the team. Like we're like that satellite above earth. Like we're looking at everything. Right. And as an assistant coach, you're basically looking through binoculars like you're focusing on one thing. So now you have a better interaction with that player on a personal level, because some head coaches, you know, some players feel about head coaches that they're not really approachable. And we are, you know, but, you know, sometimes you as a player, you need somebody to vent to. <laughs> right. Sometimes like, man, coach, you know, coach is giving me a hard time. He's always taking me out. And then that assistant coach can come to you and say, yeah, but. You know, I hear you, but what coach is trying to do is this, this, and this, yeah. right? And that will help you build that bond because, you know, as a head coach, when you talk about winning, right? And I got this from Jeff Van Gundy. He said, four things keep you from winning. Talent, you know, are you in shape? Do you defend? And are you unselfish? 
And the hardest thing for players to realize is when they're being too selfish for a team, because any good team or great team, there's a level of sacrifice. Now, players hear that and they say, yeah, I want to win. And you're right, coach, we should sacrifice until it's them that need to, be, to do the sacrificing, right? And what is sacrifice? All right, maybe you have to play less minutes. Maybe you have to come off the bench. Maybe you have to take less shots. Maybe you don't get the credit, you know, in the media, right? All those things that you think are important don't help us win, right? And there's always a defense mechanism that goes up because you're keeping me from doing me. You know, you're holding me back. No, no, no. I'm trying to make it better for everybody because when we win, everybody gets what they want. You get paid more right? You get to another country, you know, all those, you play at a high level, all those things happen when you win. I was a second leading scorer in, in, uh, in Belgium my first year when I played in Villeborn. We finished ninth. Do you think that helped me? That's the, that's the thing every team said. Well, you finished next to last, right? And then when I played in Bree, we finished first in the regular season and my stats were half of what I did in Villeborn and I got a better job. So it's all about winning, right? So you got to explain mm-hmm. that to players that you have to sacrifice to get what you want. Yeah. We, we talked a little bit uh, about professional uh, way, but the people who knows you, they know Ronnie McCollum also youth practices, youth players, very important. You have some um, camps you organize in the US. Can you tell us a, a little bit more about that? Yeah, uh, this would be my... <laughs> We didn't have it last year. This will be my 17th year doing a camp in my hometown. Okay. And, you know, I come from an American football town. And when I say American football, it's like people go crazy. Like, like I grew up, I grew up 30 minutes from the University of Alabama. And if you know about Alabama college football, they've been champions seven times in the last 11 years, I think, or something like that. It's, it's ridiculous, right? So, you know, when 102,000, 103,000 people show up for a football game, on a Saturday to watch amateurs, you can tell how they love football. And, you know, my cousin was drafted by the Milwaukee Bucks and he is like my idol. And he did camps for many years and it really helped me. And, you know, and I wanted to do the same thing to help kids that next generation of players, right? And we, you know, you don't do it for the money, you do it because you love doing it, right? And, and that's the thing. And, it's, and for people who never want to camp, they don't know how much work it is. Like, it's a lot of work to run a camp. And I love it. My wife is there every day helping me. My kids are in it. You know, we've had a couple of Division I players that came through the camp. They come back and work the camp. So I'm really excited about that. And it's interesting when you start doing the camp and the kid is like seven, eight years old. And then he still comes to the camp when he's 18. And then he works your camp. You know what I mean? Those kind of things. Are, and one, it makes me feel old, but it's also a special thing to see, right? When you're like, I remember you the first year you came and you were seven years old and now you're in college. You know, so those kind of things are interesting. And, you know, you we, we just talk about skill set. And, you know, I get asked this question all the time and, you know, it's kind of changed over the years. But, you know, what I've gone into is that people always ask, what's the biggest difference between Belgian kids, youth kids and American youth kids? Mm-hmm. Belgian youth kids are more skilled, technically sound. They shoot it better. They, they handle it the proper way. They understand team concept. They share the ball. American kids are competitive. And I think that's the biggest issue holding Belgian basketball from being, you know, really, really good. It's the competitive nature of everyone, the coaches, the players, the parents, because You guys know how this works. When you need a practice in December, oh, little Johnny can't come. He's got an exam in two weeks. Like in America, no one says that. And education is important to us. It's just like we're competitive to a certain point where, you know, it's almost not good. Like you have parents who fight in the bleachers at a lot of youth games because they're so competitive. Like kids in America are just uber competitive and uber tough because you know for a lot of kids it's an avenue for a better life the american know? dream right you know and and i played basketball one because i loved it and i wanted to be good at it because i could get a scholarship you know i saved my family over 125,000 dollars 
to go to university, right? To graduate. That's that's an incentive, right? You know, and here, you know, you don't have that aspect of it because, you know, kids in America, by the time you're 12 or 13 years old, if you're not good enough to make the school team, they cut you. Well, here, nobody gets cut. There's every level for it. So that makes the competitive nature dip a little bit too, because you know, there's always a spot for you. And I'm not saying one is better than the other. It's just, I think there are a lot of good players here in Belgium, but I think the competitive nature of people is completely different. Mm -hmm. And talking about the, the school concept, because we don't have that here in Belgium, do you think with your experience in the States, is that something that could work in Belgium or? Uh, no, because in America, we have this thing called zoning, which means the neighborhood that you live in is the school that you have to go to. Yeah. So, you know, like here, you can pick pretty much if you register the kid there or, you know, you can ride the bus for 30 minutes and go to the high school or middle school if you choose to. In America, that's not possible because, you know, we had that zoning issue. So, you know, we can live on the same street across the street from each other and you go to one school and I go to the other because that's where the line is. That's just how it is in the States. Uh, yeah. And in America, it's interesting you say it because now people are trying to get the club concept more like they have in Europe. So now you can consolidate all the good players together, regardless of what neighborhood they live in, to kind of play together. Okay. And is it is this then in a competition or something? Or yeah, we, we have a thing called AAU, which is yes. summer basketball, and that's basically a club thing. But you know, when back in 1993, when I first started playing uh AAU, you know, you play with your regional team. It was like a basically a provincial all-star team and you play together and you play all across the country. Yeah. But by the time 1996 rolled around when I was getting becoming a senior in high school, you start playing teams from California and they have two or three guys from New York and Florida. And you're like, wait, 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 wait. we just played you last weekend. How, how are these guys on your team? Mm-hmm. Yeah, 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 we have a Nike sponsor. We have money. They flew him in just to play the game. Right. Mm-hmm. So every weekend with AAU, you're traveling the country and you're trying to play for in front of college coaches to get a scholarship. So one summer, I think I played like 85 games from the month of the end of May to the end of July. And we one week we were in Florida. We were in South Carolina. We went to Michigan. We basically traveled everywhere. And, you know, when shoe companies start getting involved, it really took off. And now You know, they put AAU teams together where they're like eight or nine future NBA guys that live all over the country. So it's kind of gotten out of hand a little bit. Yeah. Nice. No, no. Great. Um, Coach, maybe I, one other question. Um, which part or which aspect of coaching does Coach McCollum love the most? <laughs> well, for, for me, my favorite part of coaching is... ATOs. I love drawing up ATOs. <laughs> and it's kind of comical because there's a guy on my team now, he calls me Picasso. He was like, he's going to draw up something crazy. Like, and he was like, here comes Picasso, right? So, you know, for me, I want to be, you know, I don't think offense happens by chance because Gunnar, if I want you to get the ball in a certain spot to go to your strength, I'm going to draw up a play for you to get the ball You know, it's not going to find you by chance. Like, and there's 14 opportunities for ATOs. The jump ball, each team has five timeouts and the end of the first, second, and third quarter. So there's 14 opportunities for me to steal points. So why not use that, right? And then if you teach players how to play and not what to play, it becomes easier. Now, what we do in Loma is that we don't have plays one up, one down, two up, two down. We don't do that. We call out the action, right? So, you know, if we're in a situation where I want a certain guy to get the ball, we'll just go, all right, double. And that basically means, you know, a staggered away, right? Or we'll go chase action. And a chase action is when you pass to the big and go for the handoff. We'll just call it out. Mm -hmm. And that adds an element of we can continue to add things on, right? So if we want to put two actions together, we'll call ram, you know, we'll say ram, floppy, flare and that's the play and now these guys know because they understand concepts and terminology it becomes easier so you can be so creative because you can't add things to one down one side and one up 
Mm-hmm. Right. You can't add it on the fly. So we will just come down and at the free throw line, I'll talk to the point guard and say, oh, you know what? Let's run. Uh, let's run flip Ricky for this guy. OK, we got it. Boom. We're right in the flip Ricky. Whether we practice that or not, they know what a flip is and they know what a Ricky is. So we're right into our action. I, I love the ATOs and, and Gunnar is, is, is going to know what I'm, I'm going to tell. One time I, I played against uh, Oxaco and I draw a play. A play. And we scored, it was halftime play, so before the buzzer. And I think we were two points behind, and we shoot a three-pointer in. And I said, okay, now we won. We win. We win. <laughs> and that's why the ATOs are so important. But the other side, coaches doesn't know. ATOs, you have to train. Not the play, but you have. they have to concentrate every time. So on practice, sometimes what I do, okay, I draw a play. Like you, you do. I just draw something. Okay, now we do this. And sometimes I fail. Sometimes I win. But the players, they they focus. And then I know if it's money time and they have to do an ATO, they can do it. Absolutely. I agree with that. We, we do the same thing. Like sometimes in practice, I'll just call a timeout. Mm-hmm. And I'll call the white team over and I'll drop an ATO. Because now you're training them for when the game happens. Yes. So now you know, the emotion of the game affects thinking mm-hmm. and concentration. And, you know, you got to make sure, you know, guys have the proper eye contact. No one's talking when you're talking. Those things are so important at practice. You know, we have a rule in Loma is that, you know, and it's not to be arrogant or to make me a dictator is when I'm talking, no one else is talking because I only want to see it once, right? And, and I speak in sound bites, right? It is short sentences, quick, 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 and we're on to the next thing. So now, and I tell them, I was like, if you're talking when I'm talking, that means somebody can't hear what I'm saying. And that messes everybody up. So that's what we go. And we have to make sure that we have eye contact because if you're not looking at me, how do I know you're listening? You know, and we have to deal with that language barrier too, right? So mm-hmm. I coach the A team, the B team and the U18 in Lowell. So now when you have the U18 guys, You know, their English is not as good as the guys who've been with me for four or five years. So now you have to be really crystal clear. So we need eye contact. No one's talking when I'm talking and feel free to ask questions. And you have to have an environment where people are, you know, comfortable asking questions, right? If there's something that you don't understand, say so. Yeah, everybody says, yeah, yeah, we do it, but then they don't understand. I'm like, no, tell me. And then, you know, don't stop practice because you're tired. If you have a genuine question, Ask it. Let's talk about it. You know, we even discuss when we're doing scouting report on the opponent and I say, okay, we're going to ice this, this pick and roll. And they're like, no, 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 coach. I can get through. Okay. You can get through. Yeah. yeah, Don't worry about it. I got it. Okay. We're going to get through on that. You know, and guys will tell me, you know, and I say, okay, we're not going to front this guy. And then he'll say, yeah, I want to front him coach because you know, he, he's a little bit soft. If I get in front of him, he won't do anything. I said, okay, you're asking for it. You got it. Make sure you get it done. And is more ownership into that, you know, and I've had players in the past say, coach, hey, take me out. I'm not helping the team put so-and-so in, you know, and that built, you know, that builds so much trust between each other because we have that dialogue and you have to be accept, not accepting, but you have to understand when a player gets mad at you and you have an argument because, you know, you argue with the people you live with. Right. You know, if you're married, you definitely argue. That doesn't mean you don't love them. Right. But there's a discussion going on and you love this person. So now, of course, we're around each other, you know, four days a week. So there is going to be some friction. Right. And then, you know, we're not going to get in in each other's face and call each other bad words and want to punch each other. But there is dialogue and there's an argument, you know, and once it's over, it's over. You know, and I go up to him, hey, you know what? You were right. You know, my bad on that. I got on you too hard. That's my fault. You know, and then it's always de-escalating everything because you're going to argue with people. And, I, and I, I hate it when coaches kick people out of practice for disagreement on strategy. You know what I mean? Like we as coaches are not always right. You know, we need players input because they're the ones playing. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I think that just one feature of the competitiveness that you have to show. So uh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I, I had a discussion once with the coach. He said, um, you took a guy to, out of the game and he gave you attitude. I never would have put him back in. And I said, I don't agree with that. He said, why? I said, here's my understanding of it. Players want to play. 
if I take you out of the game and you're happy about it, I might not put you back in, right? I, it's okay to be mad. Now, I don't want you over there kicking water bottles and throwing towels. No, I don't want that. But as you come by and you slap my hand a little bit harder than you normally would, and you're like, oh, you know, that's okay. That means you want to be there. You know what I mean? Because you, if you ever take a guy out of the game and he's okay with that, then he's okay with sitting on the bench for the rest of the game. Mm -hmm. And if he doesn't slap the hand, is this something you... Yeah, usually, usually, usually when I take a guy out of the game, he'll slap, we, we'll give each other a high five. You know, we, mm -hmm. we want to be connected as a team. We want to high five each other. And as he comes by, you know, what we talked about earlier, you know, speaking sound bites, quick sentences, and I'll make a correction because if a player, you take a player out and he walks around the sideline and goes to the other side of the bench and he doesn't come past you, yeah. you miss that moment to correct it. Now yeah. you have to walk to the end of the bench, turn your back to the action and you're missing things. So as he's walking by and I'm looking on what's on the court, what's going on, you know, say, you know what? Hey, you missed that box out. You got to sprint back, you know, come on, you can do better than that. I'm going to put you right back in. You got to give encouraging words mm -hmm. as they come by, because if you say nothing, you know, there's a thousand things going on in a player's head. Yeah, that's, that's correct. Uh, very correct. What, very interesting. What would you give uh, to the young coaches? What advice would you give to them? If you need to say three things, what, what kind of advice would you give to them? Ooh, that's, 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 that's a hard one. But... <laughs> that's, a, that's a hard one. Um, learning never stops. Uh, be creative and don't be afraid to fail. Uh, for me, being fired made me a better coach. It did, right? Because now after you get fired, you self-reflect, right? You, you go through that, you know, you know, you go through that anger stage and then you have to look at yourself in the mirror. And you're like, you know what? I could have done that better. You know, I can do that better. I'm going to do that better. You know, I can connect with players and the older I've gotten, You know, the first team I ever coached was 10 year old girls when I was in college, I was 19 years old. Thought I knew everything. You know, they, they, we had this term being on the top of Mount Stupid when the less you know about something, the louder you talk about it, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. being on, I was on top of Mount Stupid, right? I thought I knew everything. Found out I didn't know anything, right? And I coached them for six summers, you know? And come to find out six of those girls played college basketball and two play college soccer. So I'm really proud of that, you know, having a hand in their development. And then, you know, when I played in hotel and I started coaching the U21s, we won three national titles, uh, you know, with the U21s three years in a row, you know, and then you really start thinking that you know everything, right? And then mm -hmm. when you get fired, it, it brings you back down to earth. And you're, you're saying, you know what, my relationship with players could be much better. Because, you know, as a young coach, you think it's all about X's and O's. You think it's just plays, 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 plays. And then you get away from teaching the game and that real communication with players. Because, you know, the thing that I most regret about the Lindbergh experience was, you know, you know, getting fired is bad. But we lost two players during that season because I didn't communicate well with them. Mm -hmm. You know, we brought in another guard And the guy we already had thought we were replacing him. Well, I could have fixed that if I would have just gone to him and said, hey, he's not here to replace you. He's here to move you to the two sometimes, too. I still love you. We still believe in you. You know, I could have fixed that relationship. Then the other guy who ended up we had to let go, you know, he was frustrated about his role because I didn't explain it well enough to him. Right. Those are situations I could have fixed. Right. And, you know, what I said earlier, you don't know what you don't know. You need to go through that, make a mistake period in order to be better. Because if you win everything, you're not really learning anything because, you know, ah, I don't do that well, but it's okay, we win. And, mm -hmm. you know, the older you get, you appreciate the practices more than the games. As a player, the last three or four years of my career, I love the practices more than the games. Mm -hmm. You know, going up against... You know, in hotel and going up against Hans Van Wayne and Jonas Delahue and, you know, those guys every day in practice, you know, they're a lot younger and bigger and more athletic. And when I would score, I would just tell them all about it, you know, and that made me happy. And then, you know, we're in the locker room after practice. I'm like, man, I was killing you today. Just, you know, getting under their skin a little bit. But, you know, you appreciate those things. And, you know, me as a coach now, I love the preparation for practice. Love it. Like you can do so many things and you can be creative and, 
those kind of things. And, you know, that's the problem sometimes when you put people in a box, right? You, you make them feel like they can't make mistakes and they're not being creative. You got to be creative. How do you know what works until you try it? Coach, we know you, you also see to the Euro Millions League, and this is something funny. You talked about uh, practice against uh, Delalieu, Van Van, and that you talk to them if you score. What do you think uh, about the trash talk? In, I think it was in game two, uh, Rono Gilert goes to the bench and says, we don't, know, we don't need trash talk in this game. What do you think about this? I, I, I think what, what happens is, as a coach, you want them to focus on the task, mm -hmm. right? But I mean, sometimes it's okay to talk trash as long as it doesn't become personal, right? Mm -hmm. If it, as long as it stays on the, the up and up, like I, I'm just killing you. Like, you know what I mean? Like it, it was one of those things because for me as a player, I used to find things that would irritate me about my matchup so I could go at this guy. If I found out he made more money than me, oh, I'm definitely going at this guy tonight, you know, and I'm telling him like, you make more money than me, but I'm better. You know, those kind of things. Yeah. You, know, you got to find something to, to get you going, right? Because, you know, reading Michael Jordan's book, you know, what made him so great is that he was able to find something that irritated him and he flipped the switch. You know, he would make up stories about players on the other team saying stuff to him and he would get 50. Well, whatever gets you to that level of competitiveness, that's perfectly fine. As long as it's nothing dirty or, you know, you say things that you shouldn't say to people, then it's okay. Another dis discussion with my friends was, at what age can you start with this? What if a, a youngster of, of, of 16 years old starts trash talking what do you say as a coach well it, it depends on how it goes is it is it distracting to the other guys on the team because if you come to america there's eight year olds out there talking trash and it's the whole team and it's mom and dad and the bleachers doing the same thing but here the environment is a little bit different you know you might have guys on the team that that are embarrassed because their teammate is talking trash As long as it's not taken away from the core values of your team, I think it's okay because, you know, sometimes, you know, people, people say things, you know, you have to say it like I'm killing you today. Like you, somebody needs to suffer for you because you can't stop me. You know, like Luca in the game, you know, against the Clippers, he's posting up Pat Beverly and he's saying he's too small as he's going to the basket. Right. You know, Trey Young making threes and bowing. Those, those kind of things add a level of entertainment to it as well. Yeah, I love it. I think, and just the same like Dennis uh, told uh, in a podcast, trash talk is basketball. And, is. and I think it's very important. We can do it sometimes, if yeah. it's on the level, not uh, about family, uh, race, yeah. and, and, and religion. And, Absolutely. Yeah. Yes, this is important. And this people need to know talk trash, but do it smartly. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. No, correct. Okay, coach, I think we, we got a lot of food for thought. Eh? Uh, I really appreciate it uh, that you give us that many insights. I think our viewers really appreciate you answering their, their questions uh, uh, to make them a better version as a coach themselves. So, uh, yeah. Uh, no. I just, I just have to say before before we go, you know, like, again, Mike and Gunnar, thank you so much. And uh, Gunnar, you know, please don't kill us this year. And please tell your brother, don't kill us either. Uh, your brother cost me a championship my last year playing. I'm still irritated about that. So, <laughs> okay, so no, and, and, and the, uh, the other thing is, is that, you know, Uh, if any of the coaches on here want to reach out to me, I'm available. Uh, I'm on Twitter, Ronnie McCollum at Twitter. I'm on Instagram. Uh, I'm on Facebook. You can shoot me a message and, you know, we can talk basketball. For me, I love talking basketball. I can do it all day, all night. No problem for me. If you have questions or comments or anything, just, you know, feel free to reach out to me. I think they, they appreciate this very, very much, uh, Coach. Uh, Great message. Thank you again, Coach. Uh, I wish you all the best for the upcoming summer and uh, next season. We'll, we'll definitely meet uh, in a few months. So uh, <laughs> we're looking forward to it. So when I hear some SSI, it means we're not... <laughs>
playing well, but that's okay. Sounds good. Sounds good. Thanks a lot, guys. I really enjoyed it. Thanks, Coach. Thank you, Coach. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Onze volgende gast is een huidig Europees kampioen. Alexander Sekulic was assistent coach van de Sloveense nationale ploeg die in 2017 goud won. Momenteel is hij zelf de headcoach van de Europees kampioen. En dit combineert hij met een functie als assistent coach bij het Nimburg van Retin op Basso Han.